an emerging economy whose growth momentum is increasingly felt by the world. A country seeking to tap its vast oceanic resources. Join us this week as Rui Chenggang sits down with Indonesia's senior policymakers who share their views on the outlook of the country, only on this talk. Indonesia, a country that conjures up images of beautiful holiday landscapes, a thriving seaside economy, and a bustling manufacturing sector. After surviving the global financial crisis in 2008, the resilient Indonesian economy is increasingly making its presence felt around the world. The World Bank predicts that by the year 2025, Indonesia, together with other major emerging economies, the likes of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Korea, will contribute half of the world's total economic growth. The optimistic outlook for the Southeast Asian country is largely inspired by Indonesia's impressive macroeconomic numbers, revealing a robust economy and thriving trade. In 2008, when most major economies were embroiled in the raging financial crisis, Indonesia was a rare bright spot. The country's GDP soared by 6.46% in 2011, and in 2012, its economic growth stood at 6.23%, ranking second place amongst G20 countries only after China. In an interview with CCTV last year, Indonesia's president, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, says he welcomes Chinese investors. Uh, many of us in China are looking at the economic success or miracle. Investasi harus tumbuh dengan pesat. Demikian juga komponen yang lain trade kami harus tingkatkan agar dua uh, hal itu investment and trade betul-betul menjadi komponen atau penyumbang utama bagi pertumbuhan. So what are some of the other areas that you would like to see Chinese investment uh, contributing to the Indonesian economy. Yang juga sangat saya harapkan dari Tiongkok adalah untuk private sectors dari Tiongkok pembangunan infrastruktur di bawah kami punya master plan MP3EI 15 tahun ke depan kami akan mengembangkan banyak sekali infrastruktur sea transportation, air transportation maupun land transportation yang masih harus kita kembangkan 5, 10, 20 tahun ke depan. Saya mengajak partner dari negara-negara sahabat uh, dalam hal ini Tiongkok untuk juga bersama-sama mencari opportunity atau peluang baru di dalam pembangunan infrastruktur itu. President Susilo's confidence is well founded. At the end of 2011, two of the world's top three rating agencies upwardly adjusted Indonesia's sovereign debt rating to invest. This held enormous significance for the Southeast Asian country. Fifteen years after the Asian financial crisis, Indonesia regained that rating level, which would make it an attractive destination for long-term global investment. As expected, the country's foreign direct investment soared to a record high of 32.5 billion U.S. dollars in 2012, the year after the rating adjustments. The country's investment authorities raised its target amount for foreign investment this year by a quarter to 40.4 billion dollars. The Indonesian government plans to invest $200 billion in transport, telecommunications, and energy infrastructure by the year 2025. As the government's financial capability could only fund between 10% to 20% of the total, a large portion will have to rely on private investors. That means opportunities for foreign investors. According to the Indonesian government, more than a thousand Chinese companies have already invested in Indonesia with total investment amounting to 28 billion U.S. dollars as of September of last year. Although China only accounts for around half percent of Indonesia's foreign direct investment, Chinese firms are becoming increasingly enthusiastic about investing in the Southeastern Asian nation, especially after the establishment of a China ASEAN free trade area. A planned construction of a cross-sea bridge linking Indonesia's Java and Sumatra Islands has attracted 20 foreign companies, mostly Chinese firms. And also there's a lot of interest uh, in, in China mm. about investment targets in Indonesia. Before I came here, there were a lot of talks about um, possible Chinese participation or contribution to the project of uh, Sundai Street. You know, projects like these, huge infrastructure projects linking different islands yeah. uh, of Indonesia. Uh, there are interests w so among the... Java. Exactly. There are interests among the SOEs. There are also interests from the private businessmen, particularly from the southern part of China, who are looking for opportunities to expand in Southeast Asia. Um, 
are these uh, solid projects for, or, and, and are these projects uh, available for Chinese uh, investments? There, they have been available and they will always be available. Uh, I think the concept of uh, public-private partnership has been introduced a uh, long time ago and the concept of uh, the private sectors participating in any business uh, proposition, especially if it involves infrastructural development, uh, that is something that I know will not unwelcome in Indonesia. It's a greatly desired and needed commodity uh, to be able to link one point and another. We've got a lot more fiscal space. You know, we've been able to maintain our budget deficit at about 1.5 to 1.7 percent vis-a-vis the GDP, and we've been able to trim down debt uh, to only 23, 24 percent of the GDP uh, vis-a-vis 90 percent, uh, you know, a few years ago. And we've got the very robust uh, investment climate, uh, 25 to 30 percent rise of realized investments every year in the last three. We've got to take a view on the infrastructure. We've got to build a lot more ports, airports, railroads, power generation capabilities. But along with great expectations, Indonesia also faces quite a few challenges. Indonesia is widely known for its vibrant manufacturing sector, partly due to lower labor costs and rich resources. However, a lack of advanced technology has prevented the manufacturing sector from moving up the value chain. Though being the largest producer and exporter of crude oil in Southeast Asia, Indonesia's processing capability is far from being satisfactory due to a lack of technology and funding. As a result, it has to import many petrochemical products for domestic consumption. Experts warn if no efforts are made to upgrade the local industry, it will lose competitiveness even in a domestic market. The growing wealth gap is another major issue. In the country's capital city of Jakarta, modern office buildings, luxury hotels, and high-tech centers stand in stark contrast adjacent to dilapidated slums and villages. Experts say the income disparity will become a major hurdle for the country's economic ascent. Outdated traffic infrastructure is also a major headache facing the capital city. In a metropolis with a population of more than 10 million people, Jakarta has only one overpass and no underground transit system. With a ballooning population and rapid development, Jakarta, which has 40% of its area below the sea level, has also become the victim of flooding. The World Bank has warned the northern part of the city could be submerged by 2025 if no effective measures are taken. In addition, worsening pollution, rising crime rates, and water shortage are also burdening the bustling city. President Susilo has offered to relocate the capital from Jakarta as one option to overcome these problems of urbanization. When one examines our economies, one might say, as the old saying goes, the weakest part or link of a chain determines how strong that is. Do you have similar concerns? What would you think might be some of the weakest links? How we've dealt with income disparity, how we've dealt with natural disasters, disasters. Uh, those are elements uh, of uh, not just the economy, but of the social equation that I think have kept us uh, more vigilant than ever to basically take a view on what needs to be done uh, in the future. I heard that uh, President Susilo has proposed that uh, one of the scenarios is for you to, um, to keep Jakarta as an economic center and move the political part, the capital, the political capital elsewhere. Um, is that possible scenario still being discussed? Well, nothing is impossible in this world, right? Uh, but uh, I think that will require a much more in-depth uh, evaluation uh, in terms of where we uh, go. Uh, I mean, whatever it takes for not only the city, but the citizens of the city to be functioning uh, properly, uh, I think the government is in a position to take a view. Uh, but in the meantime, I, I think we're we're here in Jakarta. We've got to deal with uh, whatever issues. It's not just the flooding, but it's the traffic congestion and it's the, you know, the ins and outs of uh, people who want to urbanize and de-urbanize on a daily basis. Uh, I think there needs to be better management 
of uh, and you know I was with the governor of the city of Jakarta this morning. I was with him two days ago. Uh, I think there's a great aspiration to basically take a view on many of these uh, important aspects. But I think what people need to understand is that it cannot be resolved overnight. Uh, this will take time, uh, but sometimes the people themselves, they want things done yesterday. Uh, and I think they just need to uh, understand better that this will require more time. Situated in the tropical area with long coastal lines, Indonesia is blessed with vast and rich fishing resources. But the development of this unique advantage has far lagged behind its peers due to a lack of investments into this sector. Though it is the second largest seafood producer after China, Indonesia's fishery exports have failed to gain a top 10 spot in the world. Now Indonesia is seeking to shift its focus from land resources to ocean resources and put its weight behind developing the blue economy. According to its blueprint, the Indonesian government aims to develop the country into a major global exporter of sea products by 2015, with a total output up by two-thirds from its 2012 level and exports by 70 percent. And the southeastern country will not try to achieve this single-handedly. Again, China is still considered a major partner. The two countries signed a memorandum of understanding back in March 2012, days before an Indonesian delegation, led by the country's Maritime Affairs and Fisheries Minister, visited China, a trip aimed at learning from China's experiences in ocean fishing, sea product farming, and logistics. That was followed by a $650 million partnership agreement between the two countries. Under the cooperation deal, China and Indonesia are to build a joint fishing base and cold chain logistics in the Southeast Asian country. Indonesia is blessed with one of the longest coastlines in the whole world. And as a matter of fact, ocean accounts for probably 80% of your total territory. So I assume that the ocean economy plays a critical part to a beautiful country. We are now actually the second biggest uh, produce uh, fisheries in the world after China. We produce about now the aquaculture as well as the capture. It's about, uh, about 15 million tons together. And Chinese uh, has produced around uh, 56 million tons. That's consisting of 40 million tons of the aquaculture and the 16 million tons for the capture. So we are still uh, has to work very hard to, to catch up with, uh, with China. But then, uh, since uh, we have potential uh, resources, so we have aimed that you know, when 2020 at least, we're going to catch up uh, production of, of China. Indonesia is not yet one of the world's top 10 uh, countries in terms of uh, fishery and marine uh, resources output value. But uh, I'm, I, I assume that you soon will be because now you, are, you have shifted your attention from the land economy to the ocean economy. We, the government now, it's been you know, years that we are still concentrating in the land uh, economy, based on land economy. But then now what we are uh, thinking or we are, we are directing direction is towards the ocean-based economy. So that's why me as uh, Minister of uh, Marine and Fisher, Marine Affairs and Fisheries, we are now working very hard to convince that, especially to the uh, private sector, that ocean base, uh, economy based on ocean is one of the potential you know, to do business in the future. Yeah. In 2011, uh, the Chinese leaders uh, announced the plans uh, together with um, ASEAN leaders about establishing uh, a special fund uh, with a grant of Chinese uh, um, a contribution of up to 3 billion RMB uh, aiming at um, boosting cooperation in our ocean uh, projects. What might be the uh, Indonesian uh, expectation for that? Uh, we have actually uh, signed uh, uh, what do you call this? MOU 
or agreement with Chinese government. It, it was uh, done last March 2012. And that MOU, or, uh, MOU we, had, uh, we signed for uh, five different or four different uh, areas, like for marine uh, product, for uh, tourism, uh, communication, as well as uh, education. So with these four different kind of sector, Chinese government has uh, uh, made an agreement that we, they're going to grant us 1 billion RMB. That is about maybe 100 and something uh, US dollar, million US dollar. So uh, for my part, in the marine uh, sector, we have uh, made an agreement to make several, uh, what do you call this, uh, surveillance in the different kind of area in Indonesia, as well as, you know, later we, 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 we had uh, proposed to the government, uh, government of China, we proposed to have an um, uh, airplane that can actually uh, do the, uh, uh, what do you call this, survey, as well as to make a uh, picture filming for the about 10 meters high of the sea. So we can have uh, all the data uh, even more accurate if, if we have that kind of uh, aeroplane. So we hope this agreement can be uh, signed in next June 2013. You see. I hope that uh, Indonesia and China and then with the advance of your uh, economy with your technology, you know, we like to, of course, work together so that uh, we like to invite you know, all the investors or private sector to come to Indonesia. With Indonesia has this big potential, natural resources, uh, agriculture, fisheries, as well as all these services industries. You know. Blue economy concept, also a buzzword in Indonesia. Blue yeah. economy. Blue economy is a concept that is uh, it's a new paradigm of concept of, of economy that we are more uh, uh, looking into uh, sustainable development economy. So, sustainable development economy is a it's a it's a must. It's you it's a need to to to, to go to that uh, direction. Because uh, with this uh, blue economy, the concept is how we're going to uh, do business without waste. So uh, we have to really uh, maintain our conservation of the water, everything, so that we won't give the pollution and so forth. So this is the second step for us, that blue economy is a concept to do a new kind of business. You see. So uh, I hope that the blue economy will give more jobs, create more jobs. With innovation and creativity, we will get even more revenues. So with the revenues, then, of course, the uh, welfare of the, our people will have a better life uh, for next, uh, next time. Yeah. And what might be your expectations for uh, collaboration or cooperation with China on the blue economy front? I think we have done uh, several discussion, dialogue with Chinese, and since actually uh, if you are talking about the volume of uh, ocean, we have more than Chinese, but then uh, we are learning from, from the Chinese uh, government about this uh, blue economy in, uh, to, to build with the blue economy concept for, for tourism because I'm talking about a uh, concept that's not only for fisheries, but we're talking about tourism, even for industry that is uh, related to ocean uh, potential development, as well as um, the media of transportation uh, for the, let's say, the, the, the shipping and so forth. So these are all actually eco blue economy concepts that is actually related with ocean. So 
Chinese is uh, one of the uh, maybe one of the country that has success, succeeded in uh, uh, building a city uh, as a blue economy uh, concept business. And I think I've, I've been there. It was in uh, Guangdong, I think. And there was uh, the, the the city is more for tourism, ocean tourism. And it was it's quite successful, and there is no heavy industry. On January 1st of 2010, a free trade area was officially initiated between China and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. For Indonesia, as an ASEAN member, the tourism sector was one of the first industries to benefit from this agreement. The Indonesian government has issued favorable travel measures to attract Chinese holidaymakers from China, which is now the world's top tourist source market. These efforts are paying off. In 2012, a total of 618,000 Chinese tourists visited Indonesia, soaring by more than one-fifth higher than a year ago. Industry insiders say the rise in Chinese visitor numbers has bolstered Indonesia's tourism industry as it helps offset a decline in tourists from more developed economies due to unfavorable economic recovery in these countries. Mari Pengetsu, Indonesia's Minister of Tourism and Creative Economy, is arguably the most direct witness of the positive changes brought about by the FTA deal. The idea was met with fierce domestic opposition when it was proposed due to concerns that an FTA with China could take a major toll on Indonesia's domestic industries, such as textile, furniture and steel, which are all major contributors to the country's economy. However, Marie Pangetsu, who was then the country's trade minister and top negotiator for the deal, firmly believed in the benefits of free trade. Despite all doubts and odds, she helped push for the establishment of a free trade area between China and the Southeast Asian bloc. We've seen uh, increasingly more Chinese tourists traveling around the world. So is there a, a conspicuous uh, drop or decline of tourists visiting Indonesia from uh, say European countries mm -hmm. and, and a sharp increase of those from, from China? Yes, uh, in terms of growth, uh, Euro you know, from Europe, uh, US and Japan, which are experiencing slowdown in the economy, it didn't go negative, there was no contraction, but the growth is like 2 to 5 percent, uh, whereas uh, uh, the incoming tourists from China is increasing at uh, 20 percent. So we hope to reach 1 million uh, by 2014-2015. In a way, because of the increased uh, Chinese investment trade, as well as the fact that they're also increasingly, Indonesians are increasingly visiting China and seeing the development of China. I think what needs to happen more is uh, for Chinese uh, investments uh, and, and trade uh, that, that come here, to be more uh, balanced, you know, to have to include more uh, of the com participation of the Indonesian uh, small and medium-sized companies. I think a wide array of goods and services to trade with each other uh, with China. Uh, this is not a zero-sum game. Uh, I think the the spirit with which ASEAN uh, nations and economies uh, have been working on or with uh, in how we want to collectively move forward is how to basically expand the pie all together uh, so that everybody is happy.